My name is uh, David Melia, and I'm Director of uh, Energy and Environment Initiatives at Haskane. So on behalf of Haskane, I welcome you as well. And today we have a great speaker who will be talking about navigating the complexities of the ever-evolving regulatory system. Now, in putting this one together, we want to start doing a little bit more of interaction with the crowd. So I want to plant a seed in your mind that the Q&A piece is extremely important for this chat. And we're very lucky because Gaetan is going to take a couple years off for himself. And he is challenging all of you to hit him hard with whatever hard questions you have on regulatory as it pertain to his experience. And don't be shy. So how many of you came prepared saying this is going to be an interactive session? Three of us. <laughs> Three of us. Who are going to listen attentively to Gaetan and then come up with great questions for him? More hands? More than four? Okay, good. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Gaetan Caron is president of G GemFX. He provides uh, consultation work. Prior to that, he was a longtime lifer, we could say, of the NEB, uh, serving as chairman, uh, as CEO, uh, and prior to that in different capacities. He's also got a Bachelor of Science in Applied Sciences from the Rural Engineering at Laval, an MBA from the University of Ottawa, but we won't hold that against him. And he is a member of the Quebec Order of Engineers. Please join me in welcoming Gaetan Caron. Oh, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. Bonjour à tous. Uh, what a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic which in and of itself is not exactly exciting, regulation. It's not unlike uh, taxes and topics like that, but we'll try and make it lively and interesting for you. Uh, the title could have been Navigating the Complexities of the Ever-Changing Regulatory System because I'm not sure it is actually evolving. It is changing for sure, and hopefully what comes out of all these changes is something good, but that perhaps remains to be seen. So the publicity for the event talked about talking about the root causes of mistrust some people have about the regulatory system and the NEB in particular. So I'm going to give you my views on what are the root causes of that. Uh, we'll talk about the options that have been considered to go from where we are to some better place. I'll talk then about the, uh, the effects of those strategies for change. Uh, and lastly, I will give you my personal opinion as to what is the uh, plausible courses of action that the government of Canada might take as a result of everything that's been said and done and all the consultations and sub-consultations on the topic. First, it's not a, a mistake to go back to where this all started. Uh, I'm going to take you back to the spring of 1956. Uh, three things of note happened there. I will mention them in passing as for context, as they say. Uh, Elvis Presley had his first uh, number one single on Billboard, Heartbreak Hotel. It was the spring of 1956. He became famous then. Uh, and at the same time, there was a great pipeline debate in Parliament that uh, is still remembered by people of my generation as, uh, and I'm quoting a, a text about that, the worst pandemonium seen in Parliament in more than a half century. And I'll get back to the Great Pipeline debate in a moment, but just imagine yourself, spring of 56, Elvis becomes famous. The Great Pipeline of 1956 is going in the parliament over three months. And then uh, I was born at the same time, so I'm a Great Pipeline <laughs> debate baby. So three things to remember about the spring of 56, at least for myself and my family. Um, so uh, let's talk more about the Great Pipeline debate. In a nutshell, I could spend an hour just talking about it, but there were two big options to move gas from Alberta to markets. One option was the all-Canadian way where you would move the gas to Winnipeg, then north of the Great Lakes, feed the Ontario and eventually the Quebec market with natural gas. This was supported by C.D. Howe, the Minister of Energy at the time. Uh, so C.D. Howe is, just not, is not just an institute. There was a person called C.D. Howe. He was a minister at the time under the, uh, the, government, the liberal government of uh, Louis Saint Laurent. And this was supported by the government, C.D. Howe, and people who were known then as the Canada Firsters. Canada First. We started it, didn't start on the other side of the border. Canada First was part of the Great Pipeline debate. And the other option was to go to Winnipeg and get the gas to the US Midwest, uh, and then have the American gas from, of course, the Gulf Coast move to, uh, at the end of the pipe, uh, to feed Ontario with gas. And the, the second option was cheaper. 
But the Canadian firsters, firsters and the government preferred the all Canadian way, a bit like I guess the, the railroads uh, helped us form a country. And uh, this is what they proposed. It was uh, a project squeezed between the hard rocks of politics and economics. And uh, I should have said Alberta, of course, and producers preferred the other option because there was better net back, less cost therefore better net back. So anyway, at the end of the day, the government prefers the all Canadian route. Uh, and to go through uh, uh, the process of approving a subsidy for the project and actually endorsing that route had to invoke closure in parliament. That's where heck broke loose and the worst pandemonium in Canadian history at the time happened. Uh, so this is, in a nutshell, my Reader's Digest summary of the Great Pipeline Debate of 1956. As a result of that, uh, a year later, uh, John Diefenbaker gets elected as conservative prime minister, and polls of the time were very clear that one of the key factors why the government lost the election of 19, the, the liberal government lost the election in 57 was the Great Pipeline Debate. That's based on opinion polls run at the time. This also ended the political career of C.D. Howe. So, 56, Presley got, got his first number hit, Pipeline Debate, I was born. 57, change of gears in terms of politics, a new world is about to begin. And in 1959, the National Energy Board was created by an act of parliament, which was almost a copy and paste from the Railway Act in terms of its moving parts and all the details. And uh, the, the, the motivation for having a separate board to deal with pipelines and the politics of it uh, was to depoliticize the pipeline debates in Canada. And this worked for half a century till about 2010. And the rest of my talk today will tell you why I think things changed in 2010 gradually to where we are today. And uh, let me tell you a bit more about that. Now, I will take a short break and, not the break, but a, a short pause to explain what they did in 59. They create what is known as a quasi-judicial body. That's very important to, to mention in passing because a quasi-judicial body is very specific. It is driven by considerations of natural justice, as the lawyers like to say. Uh, it must be free of bias, even more importantly, free of apprehension of bias, that is perception of bias. No ex parte meetings when you deal with stuff. You don't have lobbyists visiting you behind closed doors. You have everything in the public domain. And as an applicant or as an intervener against a project, you have the right to know the case that you must meet to either get approval or justify denial of a project. And those quasi-judicial bodies are independent from the government, not only from industry and environmental groups and independent, in fact, from any segment of society, but they must be independent from the executive branch of government of the day. They report directly to parliament. So that was created back in 1959 as the first uh, version of the NEB, and until until today, we have essentially the same NEB as we had in 1959, save for a few bells and whistles changed in 2012 with Bill C-38. So I'll spend a moment to talk about those in a moment because they go to the root causes of why trust has been talked about when you talk about regulation in Canada. So along the way, NEB does its job below the radar until about 2010, in a sense. But in the middle of that, there was the, uh, a very important event in the history of the sustainability movement. Uh, those of my generation do recall that the World Commission on Environment and Development, uh, known also as the Brundtland Commission, produced in 1987 a very important report called Our Common Future. Um, it is known as the Brundtland Commission because the head of the commission was the former pr Prime Minister of Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland. And uh, it is through that process that the phrase sustainable development was coined and defined. Uh, and nowadays you will say sustainability. Uh, in French, we haven't figured it out. It's still development durable. I don't know how you will ever go in French to durability, perhaps, or something like that. But anyway, uh, the language has changed, but it's the same thing. So Brundtland worked on that. And we all know, most people know the famous phrase as to what is uh, sustainability. Uh, and it is, it is in that report that you find that phrase. It is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But what is not often known about the Brunton report is it also contained very specific guidance on the process of decision making. And uh, I, those, these, these words on that slide are 
word for word quotes from the Brundtlin report. Economy is not just about the production of wealth and ecology is just not about the protection of nature. They are both equally relevant for improving the lot of humankind. And inside the report, you find the verb integrate or the noun integration all over the place. And it is central to what working towards sustainability involves, the tough choices one must make, integrating the social, environmental, and economic dimensions of a problem in the same intellectual or heart-based gesture. You got to figure it out and it's very, very difficult. So just a few more fra <coughs> phrases from Brundtlin to emphasize the, the concept. I'm reading again word for word in portion of the report. Together, we should spend the globe and pull together to formulate an interdisciplinary, integrated approach to global concerns and our common future. Environment and, and development are not separate challenges. They are inexorably linked. Uh, the concept of sustainable development provides a framework for the integration of environmental policies and development policies. There we go. Let me take then a moment to refer you to section 52 of the National Energy Board Act, passed in 1959, and the language of, uh, uh, of section 52 is roughly the same today as it was then. So parliament, because the NEB reports to parliament, not to the executive branch, not to Prime Minister Trudeau or Minister Carr, it reports to parliament. So parliament has asked the NEB when it does things in making its recommendations on the pipeline being approved or rejected, the board shall have regard to all considerations that appear to it to be direct, directly related to the pipeline and to be relevant. I will repeat the word relevant. Uh, and may have regard to a bunch of things, supply demand, and any other public interest that in the board's opinion may affect, may be affected by the issuance or the dismissal, the uh, issuance of the certificate or dismissal of the application. And since 1959, the board has had, as a matter of law, to integrate the social, environmental, and economic dimensions of the problem. And um, this is very much in, in uh, 1987, uh, direction to society which is totally consistent from the language that Diff and Baker gave birth to in 1959. People don't understand that. And when I say that, I might be seen as slightly controversial, but the NEB is in the business of making decisions in keeping of sustainability of the nation when it does that. And as part of that, it has all sorts of powers, some of them extremely uh, significant in terms of protecting safety and the environment, uh, enormous powers to enforce what it's asking companies to do, uh, powers to impose uh, fines, uh, power to initiate prosecution under the criminal act if uh, executives of a company are not acting in good faith. This is like, and nobody can stop them if they so decide. The prime minister cannot call anybody and he say you should not do this and that. It is like calling a judge, it's very bad. Uh, or calling the police officers and say you should not uh, investigate a murder. You just don't call the NEB to tell them what to do. And the power, the, these powers including the power to shut down a pipeline if the NEB, in its infinite wisdom, as we like to say internally, um, finds that the pipeline is not safe, reduce the pressure, uh, require corrective actions as a result of an audit or some inspections, and take uh, action to promote a safety culture in companies. So that's background to root causes of why there is mistrust, distrust, lack of confidence in the NEB. Uh, so as I, we embark into my, my theory as to the three root causes why we are here today, I will have a slight uh, trip to the concept of democracy. And you may have seen this too many times, but I think it's always worthy of reminding ourselves that according to Churchill, sometime after the Second World War, he said that it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. And uh, democracy has been part of our discussion in Canada, uh, especially around 2010 to today. And this is a, a picture of the debate that was going on in 2012 about C-38, an act of parliament that the Harper government was asking parliament to endorse. Uh, C-38, one passed, once passed by parliament, became the Jobs, Growth, and Long-Term Prosperity Act. And, uh, uh, Parliament asked the NEB by passing that act to change the way it did business. It asked it to have time limits for the reviews of uh, the NEB. It asked it to only consider the views of people who are directly affected by a pipeline project or if they had spe special expertise that the panel would value. 
It also gave powers to the NEB chair to take action if he or she was concerned about not meeting time limits that are part of the act. And about the same time, Parliament asked the NEB and the CNSC, the Nuclear Commission and the CEA to be, and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency to be the three bodies conducting EAs, effectively making the NEB and the CNSC responsible for their own EAs, following the principles of CEA, but doing them themselves without having to do all sort of administrative uh, dancing around with the agency about doing EAs. No, that was not the choice that the NEB made, but that's a choice that Parliament made, and the NEB and all the others were required as a matter of law, as a matter of good taste, to enforce faithfully. As a result of that, some people felt that the actions that Mr. Hopper was asking Parliament to endorse were not good, they were anti-democratic, but they were in fact democratically passed by a parliament empowered by us to take action in the form of laws to make this country one where you can invoke uh, peace, order, and good government in terms of how the nation operates. So root cause number one, in my view, you came here to hear about that stuff. Number one is the faithful implementation by the NEB of action parliament took that the NEB had to take to follow the law of the land. The second of three root causes in my mind is the matter of climate change, uh, the role of Canada in leading in the world in terms of action plan against climate change and the NEB. There was a perception until Mr. Trudeau was elected and it may have changed, I think it has changed, that the government was not interested in involving Canadians in a broad, meaningful debate as to what we ought to do to tackle the climate change challenges of this nation. And uh, people felt they had to express themselves. They had no real platform to go and say, let's debate climate change. Of course, House of Commons committees and Senate committees, but that was not an easy thing to get access to. So then they hear NEB is in town. They're going to have a hearing on the tar sands. That's not what the NEB did, but the NEB would come to town, Montreal, Toronto, other places, to talk about the merits and demerits of building a pipeline or upgrading a pipeline the li like the Line 9 uh, reversal to move more uh, oil to market. Uh, and people say, oh, we've got to go there and tell the board we want to be heard to talk about climate change. Now, what I'm gonna say next is extremely important as well. One of the few things that matter a lot that few people understand. The NEB had the evidence about the effects on pipelines upstream and downstream of those pipelines and of greenhouse gases. Production, consumption of oil, on both sides of the pipeline, it had evidence on that. It had its own expertise. And in all the cases until Energy East, panels of the NEB have said in their written reasons that this was not relevant because a pipeline taken one at a time doesn't have the capacity to affect the way Alberta will choose to develop its natural resources, does not affect the way investors will invest in pipeline capacity, sorry, in, in oil and gas development and, and production. And that one pipeline taken one at a time does not have a bearing on the way people consume oil at the other side of the pipeline. So panels of the NEB, one after the other, until Energies found that this was not relevant to the determination they had to make under Section 52. And they said, we can't hear you. This is not relevant to our work. And obviously people got upset. Uh, the Harper government was not, according to them, giving them any place to talk about climate change. The NEB was saying, we don't want to hear about it. It was perceived incorrectly as the board is not interested in environmental matters or climate change. It just, and some people even said, well, they don't have the jurisdiction, it's too big for them. It was not the reason, it was not relevant. And uh, I would say that this is, uh, and the question of relevance is something which is highly respected by the courts, the federal court in particular and the Supreme Court. If the board finds something is relevant, the court will almost never say, we think you made an error in the decision you made. Or if the a panel says it was not relevant, it would be very hard for a federal court or a Supreme Court to say, you're wrong, you should have found that to be relevant. That's what the quasi-judicial body has, it is independent, and courts will find them in error if they made errors in terms of natural justice and procedure and fairness, but the court will almost never say, you didn't have a good judgment on the matter before you. So root cause number two, Canadians felt upset if they knew at all about the NEB because the NEB says we don't want to deal with climate change on that pipeline project. Root cause number two of three. Uh, root cause number three in my, kind, in my, in my mind is uh, more a matter of opinion than a matter of fact, so uh, take it for what it's worth. Uh, in the spring of 2010, 
there were three major accidents. Um, two of them made worldwide news. Uh, and I'm talking here about the Gulf of Mexico blowout. Almost nobody on planet Earth does not recall those images of three months before they could kill the well. Um, uh, at the same time, a few months later, the Kalamazoo River uh, oil spill. And in, this f in, in early September, outside of San Francisco, the San Bruno gas pipeline rupture that killed a number of people in a residential neighborhood. Uh, followed in Alberta here by the Little Buffalo oil spill in, of the Plains Midstream Rainbow Pipeline. So there's a cluster of incidents that I think were very visible that reminded people that energy and its transportation is not without risk. But they kind of happened together with the other root causes I'm talking about, with people becoming intoler intolerant towards the risk of energy and its production, its transportation. And paradoxically, although we've had the lac Megantic tragedy with the loss of, uh, the loss of many lives, uh, 42 people killed, five still missing, uh, the intolerance, sorry, the intolerance towards movement of oil by rail uh, is not the same as the intolerance of the risk of moving oil and gas by pipelines. It's not logical necessarily or rational, but it is there. So uh, I say that this, uh, this cluster of accidents about 2000, all in 2010 and one in 2011, at least in Canada, and to some extent internationally made people say, okay, pipelines are something we need to be concerned about and asking the questions they ought to ask uh, and, and getting the answers they received. And as a result of that, of course, uh, it is normal for people to be concerned about their safety, to hold the regulators of safety accountable for those outcomes. It is normal, and this is the way it's supposed to work. Uh, but in this case, as I said, the, the intolerance uh, towards the risk is there, and um, there we are today. I have a short quiz before I move to to talking about the kind of things that have been proposed to deal with a trust issue, and kind of doing all right, David, but I'm taking more time than I had planned for my foundation work. But in any event, quick quiz. Since 1959, when the NEB was created, under federal jurisdiction, how many members of the general public have been hurt or lost their lives as a result of a pipeline under federal jurisdiction? It, rough numbers will make you pass the test. How many people have been hurt or lost their lives as a result of a federally regulated pipeline? Even hurt, or obviously lost their lives? Zero. That's the correct answer, <laughs> zero. There is, people very regretfully have lost their lives, been hurt as workers. Uh, someone was mowing the lawn, the, the tractor overturned, he lost his life, reportable incident under the NEB Act. Someone was driving away from a right of way, towards their family and had a car accident, fatality, you got number one on that year in terms of NEB regulated fatalities, but no, and, and electric room kind of, of fire. So people have been hurt as workers or contractors of pipeline companies, but zero member of the general public has been hurt, or certainly not killed by an NEB regulated facility. So people worry about the risk. And of course, I'm not talking about the environmental risk of oil spills and, or gas ruptures on what it can do to the environment, but uh, the figures and the, uh, the risk assessment sometimes are two different things. Anyway, point number two of four, uh, what has been said about what we're gonna do about this? Uh, there is some sort of a common belief among informed people uh, that uh, something had to be done about this matter of, of trust in the regulatory process and the politicians react to people's concerns and Mr. Trudeau was early on that in the campaign. This is a copy from the campaign material. Uh, we will make environmental assessments credible again. Uh, we need to regain public trust. And the uh, famous phrase at the end of that page, which by the way is no longer uttered by anybody in Ottawa, uh, while governments grant permits for resource development, only communities can grant permission. Uh, this has been re-clarified many times by the government as meaning we want to have due process so people can be heard, but uh, that's, that's not my point here. My point is that uh, the Trudeau team acknowledged the political pressure points that came at about that time. I mean, you had four things going on right now, Pipeline. You had Norton Gateway going on, TMX was early phases, uh, Line 9 was live and, and, and a topic of discussion, Energy East was laying out the foundations for an application. These four things were going on. And, People were blaming the NEB for being in the hip pocket of industry and this and that, and oil spills can kill people and, and, and destroy the environment, and they responded. 
And uh, they said, we need to deal with trust. Now, interestingly, I read everything that has, I was at the scope of the policy at the time, lots of time to read. I found for a I looked for a definition of what part of trust did they think had been lost. And all I could find is reference to what the Harper government had done, which was ill-guided and the wrong advice guide given to parliament as to the kind of laws parliament should pass to amend legislation like the Fisheries Act, the NEB Act, and SEA. Now, in that discussion, very interestingly, a little bit of a tangent, but during this discussion, um, the NEB leadership seemed to agree with the liberals. Uh, uh, before the election campaign, in fact, the, uh, the leadership was asking publicly in the public uh, forum, can Canadians trust us? Indicating that people are questioning the independence of the NEB and whether they can trust us. This is mainstream media where the leadership of the NEB is asking, can they trust us? Um, and uh, a bit later, in, in April of 15, before the election campaign still, lots of things that we do where we are stuck doing things the way we do them in front of 125 senior executives. Uh, it's time to get unstuck. And after the election, it keeps going, the COO of the NEB appears before a standing committee on environment and sustainable development in Ottawa and says that uh, since taking her position a year ago, she and the CEO were already aware that the NEB needed to change to respond to a growing issue of public trust. Um, the energy and environment discussion in Canada had changed dramatically over a short period of time and the board was not prepared to deal with that change. So we're talking about 2016 where the NEB leadership is saying, we're not ready, we're not prepared, and we're stuck in the past. So while I would not call it a root cause of mistrust towards the NEB, you certainly, if you've been fed the belief of mistrust by the first three factors I've told you, you had validation from the highest levels of the organization that you should have doubts about whether these people can be trusted. So the, the government follows up on its election campaign to deal with the trust issue and uh, the mandate letters of the prime minister to Minister uh, Carr of Natural Resources asked him to do something about modernizing the NEB. Uh, he sent a letter to Minister McKenna to revitalize and make credible again the environmental ass ass assessment process. Uh, in, in February, which is a few months after the election and the receipt by these two ministers, Carr and McKenna, of their mandate letters, they announced interim pipeline measures. And the slide here summarizes what those interim pipeline measures still in effect today provide for. Deeper consultations with indigenous peoples. In the case of TMX, there was, uh, in fact, it was more than a representative, a ministerial panel was appointed to provide advice to, uh, to the government as it was to receive the, um, the recommendations of the NEB. Uh, expanded public input into the NEB process for energy use, which took the form of appointing a number of temporary board members to do parallel discussion with folks outside of the quasi-judicial body to fit into the main process. Complicated bells and whistles there, but that's a manifestation of that commitment in the interim pipeline rules. The assessment of upstream greenhouse gas emissions. The interim pipeline measures do not ask for the downstream side of things. And that was to be conducted and has been conducted by Environment and Climate Change Canada, not the NEB but fed into the cabinet decision to accept or reject the NEB recommendations. And finally, they gave themselves some more time under the time limits that the NEB Act provides for, for the government and the NEB to deal with the business of an application, finish the work, and then the government finished the work of accepting the recommendation or rejecting it. They gave themselves more time. So that, that was the, the interim pipeline measures of February, uh, January 2016. And, uh, and then as I go through that, I, I will do a, a fast forward and summarize here when Environment Canada did the upstream check on greenhouse gases for TMX and line nine. Look at the result and tell me what it reminds you of. I'll, the two are the same language. I will read out only one on, on TMX. If the project is the only pipeline capacity added from Western Canada, there would be no incremental production and upstream emissions if the net bike price for the marginal barrel oil sample was unaffected. So they're saying, if you look at it at the margin, one pipeline at a time, as the NEB panels have done in the past, adding one more pipeline over the hundreds already in existence in North America will not change the way Alberta will decide on its natural resource development. 
uh, silent in this uh, manifestation, of course, is none of that would change the way we consumers drive our cars and the degrees of, uh, we choose for the, for the thermostat in our house. So the Environment Canada said, unless you look at it as a collective and you choke all capacity coming out of Alberta, a pipeline has no bearing on the Austrian greenhouse gases. The same thing as NEV panels that determined in the past. That was completely below the radar screen. Nobody reported on that. And when I asked my many friends in the Anglo movement, what do you think of that re these reports? They just rolled their eyes and said, yeah, it wasn't great. But that was based on an independent assessment by Environment Canada based on their scientific methods. So a bit of uh, fast forward, and I'll, I'll accelerate from now on, David. Uh, Following all of that, the government appointed two expert panels, one for the EA process. They produced a report in April 2017 uh, where they said uh, you should have all EAs changed to impact assessment, IAs. And now what you do is a, an assessment of the contribution of a project to sustainability. The effect of that would have been no more NEB, kind of a mega SIA agency, Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, responsible for decision making or recommendations to cabinet on all things that involve an impact assessment. Uh, and this could have worked. This could have worked. Uh, so hold that thought. The EA expert panel says this is what should happen. Uh, a month later, the NEB modernization panel has different recommendations. And this disappointed several people in industry, by the way, perhaps many of you in the room, but the panel recommended that you start by having a Canadian energy strategy. When you read the details, it means have everybody involved in it, so provincial, territorial, federal government, indigenous peoples, labor unions, environmental organizations, and have a consensus of what Canada's future looks like in terms of energy. And once you have that, it gets easier because then you have a project submitted to the federal cabinet to see whether they see any reason to turn it down and whether it is aligned or not with this grand vision we've all de developed together. And moreover, the government should define a broadly consensual definition of what the public interest entails. And if you do that, clear sailing afterward. Uh, and uh, they were, the, the panel recommended to no longer have a National Energy Board, but create instead of Canadian Energy Transmission com Commission uh, structured around like the EER in terms of its governance. And quickly, the NEB chair expressed support for those recommendations, feeling that, uh, and I'm just reading from public statements here, um, he welcomes overall recommendations as to a way to keep up with the times. Uh, and uh, um, these recommendations could fix some of the limitations of the regulator and help it keep up with the times. So still a concern on the part of NEB leadership that there's a bit of stuck in the past element in the way they operate in the summer of 2017. Now, the government, I've, I've communicated my, from Missouri, feelings about whether having a national strategy with a broad definition of public interest and have a one-year political check before the NEB does its work, whether it's, 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 it's practical. I don't think it is. And I believe the government uh, saw it the same way because they did not retain the recommendations of either the EA panel or the NEB modernization panel and instead came up with a document released in, uh, in June. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll spend a second to say the punchline to me in the discussion paper released by the federal government in response to the two consultation reports uh, was our government recognizes that some elements of the current system are working and should form part of the future. Refreshing. The government saying, well, if you look for reasons to not like what you have, maybe we'll find some, but essentially the foundation is solid. I was so happy to see that. I was surprised and pleasantly surprised that they said that. And the other things are all good news, I think, especially from an industry, from an industry standpoint. They will, the discussion paper says there will be an improved early planning and engagement phase involving clear direction from government. I've often heard industry people say, we're left to our own devices doing all this consultation without anything uh, from the government, including indigenous consultation, which should have started earlier, according to them, and I agree with them. So this discussion paper say, we'll do better work at the front end. Uh, 
they would eliminate the standing test, so the NEB would no longer be constrained in terms of who they hear from by the directly affected standard, which was a great irritant for many people. So that's a good thing in a sense, and the NEB will use the discretion it has had in the past to decide who's in, who's not, based on their whatever regulatory policy they have. And, uh, and, and what they would do as well in the discussion paper, and that's important, they would really go back to pre-2012, uh, pre-C38, where for major projects, you would have a joint hearing between the new beefed up agency or major projects management office responsible for all the environmental assessments of the land. Uh, but when you have an expert board like the Nuclear Safety Commission and the NEB, it would be jointly held, held with the NEB. Back to pre-2012, where joint review panels like the Northern Gateway one, it was a joint review panel, uh, they can work. So, I, I, and may, by the way, something I didn't say about the modernization panel report is that they wanted part of the NEB to go to Ottawa because there was something sinister about having employees be tainted in their thinking for working in Ottawa within, in Calgary within the oil patch. They also wanted to beef up the energy intelligence function in Ottawa by having some of the NEB staff move to Ottawa. Like about a third of the staff in my subjective uh, estimate would have moved to Ottawa as a result. But the discussion paper that I'm talking about here is saying the NEB is staying in Calgary. And that's a discussion paper. It, uh, it was out for comments till August 28th. And expect a policy response in the next uh, weeks or months. Uh, I don't see a lot of political upside to them to get it earlier for reasons I will explain in a minute. But uh, to me, this is, uh, this is a good thing compared to what it could have been. What the government is thinking of is good news as far as I'm concerned. For industry, I think for the environmental movement where the concept of the agency or super agency being introduced works, it ain't perfect. It might be expensive in terms of government resources, but hey, the alternative is what? Any of the stuff that the two advisory panels recommended? I don't think this would have been even better. I think this is better than that. In closing on content before my concluding remarks, what the dickens happened with Energy East? I watch a lot of uh, 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 British movies with crimes and stuff, and what the dickens is an expression I've acquired from watching British TV. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the short story, because David, I want to give lots of time for Q&A, and I'm not succeeding so far on that, uh, because we're committed to getting you out of here by one. Uh, the panel had decided to float a list of issues that says we're going to deal with upstream and downstream GHGs as part of the panel. TransCanada had a major letter expressing disagreement with that, and I'll spare you the details. It's a, strong, it's a strongly worded letter in the public domain. And it's in decision, the panel decided, hey, we're still going to do it. We admit that TransCanada does not have direct control. Uh, or influence on the upstream and downstream activities, but we think it's relevant to the environment and we're gonna do it anyway. It's, a, it's an unfair summary of what the board letter says, but this is what the board letter says. We're gonna do it anyway. And um, in response to all of that, TransCanada asked for a suspension of the hearing for 30 days. In the meantime, a strange letter from Environment Canada sent to the NEB saying, by the way, we've done upstream and emissions before. Uh, we offered to the NEB to take care of that for you, and not only the upstream, but the downstream. And by the time the TransCanada announced the, uh, it's pulling out of Energy East, it, uh, uh, the NEB had not responded to the kind offer Environment and Climate Change Canada. So people ask, well, the, the demise of Energy East, is that market? Is that the NEB regulatory process? Is it a political outcome? My answer is yes. <laughs> if I had more time, I'd give you a summary of good federal, federal and Supreme Court rulings that I think are good news for the industry and everybody else in terms of clarifying points of law in terms of the Crown being allowed to use the NEB as part of its Crown consultation efforts and this and that, but uh, I would prefer to give you time and Q&A in that. So, Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. I think the last, since 2010, it's been, it's been messy with all those consultations and consultations and consultations. So past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Do we think that this is the way the future looks like in terms of regulation, especially NEB regulation, like a spaghetti of conflicting vectors and this and that? My view is no. I'd say that challenge for TMX to build their expansion uh, maybe uh, 
maybe um, the, um, the, with the demise of Energy East, with the Keystone XL being a distinct possibility, uh, I think that the likelihood of having a major pipeline debate in the near future about uh, expansion of pipeline capacity to get to markets are very slim. I think we've seen all we had to see in terms of consultation and sub-consultation. If the government sticks to what they said in the discussion paper, I think it will be essentially a non-event other than usual uh, debates we're gonna have about whether it was the right thing to do. Uh, so my advice in terms of looking at the future, I will quote uh, the great Tom Petty and say, take what you can and leave the past behind. Uh, it has been messy. I think we have had a great pipeline debate of 2010 to 2017. A seven year, seven, year, seven year long pipeline debate. And I think the future is more like a quiet place where uh, in terms of pipeline regulation, uh, the days of fussing about the tools and the legislation is that are essentially over and the great debate we'll have is not about that but the debate we must have on how to reduce our consumption, how to decarbonize the planet by 2100. How do we move away from high, uh, low density housing to high density? When do we sell all the cars? When do we subsidize even more transit? This is what will make a difference in terms of achieving our climate change targets. It's not fighting and fussing about pipelines, which to me is a cop out and evades the question we must ask about how as consumers and as a society we make this work and meet our commitments in Paris and beyond. Thank you very much for your attention and we have time for questions. Uh, okay, first of all, full disclosure, I work at TransCanada and we're still drawing our eyes over Energy East. Anyway, my question would be, so you've addressed the idea that the NEB lost trust and hopefully these recommendations will regain trust. How do we regain trust for the investment community in the government? Why would anybody invest here when the rules can change? Uh, no, th thank you. Now, I did not say that what the government is doing will make people regain trust. I never said that. I said what they're doing is good stuff especially compared to the alternatives. Now, whether Canada is seen by the investment community wanting to invest in pipelines, in oil and gas, in wind farms, in the car industry, in whatever, uh, this is a much bigger policy question. And I think the Trudeau government is doing all it can to be seen as responsive to uh, what people elected them for. They fought for fighting for the middle class and, I'm oh, sorry, they didn't say that, to improve uh, the middle class fate. Economically, I think they meant. And I think they also, uh, they also campaigned for uh, the reality that they wanted to be world leaders in the fight against clim climate change. It got them elected, and I think in a democracy, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And now they're finding that what they've been doing, oops, may not get us reelected. What is goal number one of any politician? It's fair, it's not sinister. A, a, a politician must have as the primary goal to get elected, and the second goal is to get re-elected. And the third goal is to be re-elected, unless you're US president and you can't. So my short answer to your question, I'm sorry, uh, I acknowledge that right now, if you work in Houston, Texas, and you're used to investing in the US, in Texas, and someone's saying, would you like to spend so many million dollars in Canada, and you read the newspaper and you say, I'm sorry, I, maybe I will invest in Nigeria instead or, or Venezuela. Uh, it doesn't look good in comparison to the most uh, unregulated jurisdictions of the planet. But I think Canadians have asked for better than that. And I think Canadians will have to accept without the natural consequences of that, which could be an economy which is not firing on all cylinders. So far, the macroeconomics are not proving anybody wrong in terms of the choices the government has taken so far, to the detriment of a, of a company like TransCanada, of course, uh, at least at the margin for that project only. And hopefully, the, the portfolio of investments that TransCanada was very good at reminding us when they issued the press release, uh, there's a lot going on in terms of opportunities for the investor in TransCanada to, uh, to have a bright future. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Shin. Um, just wanted to... Um, get a clarification from you in terms of the um, downstream um, usage. So with this highly regulated policy that we have in Canada, it will just steer investors to, like you say, Nigeria and Venezuela. I've worked in those um, uh, industries before, so I understand. Because investor is looking for profitability. 
So why would they come to Canada to invest? Because it is actually going to mark down on their profit margins. But however, Canada has properly regulated system in place that ensure that we do not pose a lot of harm to the environment. By taking that away and having investors going to invest in some developing countries where there is no regulation in place, we are seeing actually more harm being done to the environment. And how is the government actually regulating that? Because you can't see climate change as a circular, you know, segmented fragment. It's actually a global issue. So we can't think of from Canada. So if we don't do it here, I don't see it. Nothing's going to happen to me. That's right. So is there a policy or somehow the Trudeau government is actually working on that? Well, we'll, we'll have to see. I, I really like your, the preamble to your question, and I, I applaud you uh, speaking in those terms. And uh, that's why I feel people my age should get out of the way and get the, the, the new generations take over from us. We've caused enough damage. So uh, your kind of thinking is the way I think we need to do. So wh where do we go today? I mean, Brantlin was clear in 1987. Uh, I didn't read all the quotes I had because uh, we're committed to getting you out of here in eight minutes. Okay. Eight minutes. But Brantlin said, uh, priority should be given to the world's poor. That was the language of 87. Today we would say priority should be given to the, to the world. As you said, we have a global issue of climate change, but we have a global issue of poverty. How many people in Africa still cook their meals on cow dung? And for them to achieve to one-tenth of our standard of living, somehow as a transition to relying entirely on renewables, there will be some gas-fired electricity to get a tiny range to actually cook your meal on electricity. And that's perfectly all right. And as you said, if Canada says we don't like oil, although we know it's going to be needed, especially in countries or continents like Africa that aspire to become developed, uh, we'll let others produce that oil using a, a level of regulation which is ridiculously non-existent or low, uh, we're really not thinking the way Brunton asked us to do. We have to think of the world as a whole, all of the fuels and non-fuels and rebels we need to have, and have a production of our electricity, production of uh, renewable energy and oil and gas which adopts the best available regulatory standards of the planet. And I don't know of any nation perhaps Norway. But I don't know of any nation that has a higher standard of excellence in environmental regulation in Canada. If the issue is, is one of enforcement, perhaps, or communication. So I think the Trudeau government, uh, and I, the Harper government was doing well as well. I mean, the, the, the climate change targets we have today, endorsed by Mr. Trudeau, are those that were framed by Mr. Harper. We forget that. Mr. Trudeau is fighting for the numbers Mr. Harper produced. And, and it's all about doing good every day. I won't go into sunny ways, of course. This has become totally uh, out of fashion. But it's working constructively to see what we can do with our economy, our people, our environment, and make the world a better place, including ourselves, but I say the world. And if we can help Africa, I have friends who visit Africa regularly, and they tell me, you're wrong, Gaetan. They will come out of where they are. Africa will come out of poverty, I'm told. If you visited, maybe you know that. I'm so happy to hear that. It's going to take a generation or two. Democracy, if we value democracy, will be more pervasive. People who are aggrieved and disenfranchised and, and against the system will be in fewer numbers. So uh, there will be more peace in the world, perhaps. It all comes together. But it has to go with excellence and regulation, is, I think, is part. Good national and international institutions is part of what makes this world a better one. And I hope you see it. I don't think I will, but I hope you'll see it. Hi, I was just um, wondering, I, it's kind of a two-part question. Is the NEB still politicized with sustainability considerations and duty to consult? And how does social license play into the NEB approvals of pipelines? Well, the NEB I've known has never been politicized. I worked there for 35 years. And uh, the only interaction I ever had with Ottawa was to inform them of the status of proceedings. It is fair game for a minister and the, the office of the minister to know how much time have you said you would take to finish a file. Uh, I have never seen myself directly or my predecessors as chairs and CEOs or board members or staff, I've never seen even a shadow of a doubt 
that someone in Ottawa was trying to tell us what to do. So the NAB is not politicized. It can be seen perhaps nowadays as politicized because it seems to cater to the interests of politicians, so meetings with mayors and former premiers and kind of things is part of an attempt to make the board better understood. So this perception of trust uh, I think is based on incorrect information and I think the theory of meeting with politicians um, some of it in private, unfortunately, uh, was well guided in intent, but perhaps not well implemented. And as to its focus on sustainability, I, as I said, it's been there since 1959. If you look at the reasons for the decision of the McKinsey Gas Project report, you see the language of Brunton. I was on that panel. I made bloody sure that we talk about integration. And I made bloody sure that we had the word social, environmental, and economic on that. The Enbridge uh, Norton Gateway panel in their reasons for decision had the Brunton language as well, and I think TMX as well, and, and others. So it's been there. The second part of your question, uh, did, do you recall maybe the second part of your question? If you can repeat that, just, just so I'm not putting words in your mouth. Just a few words and I will recall. How does social license play yeah. into the NEB approvals of pipelines? Social license is something that uh, I replace in my language by the word public interest. Uh, Mr. Trudeau himself backed out of the phrase that communities grant permission, uh, government grants permission. Social license is not defined by anybody. And uh, if I were generous, I would say it has meaning in terms of uh, a voice you give people who are opposed to projects or initiatives to express themselves and invoke that social licenses have been achieved. The most advanced jurisdiction that has studied the concept of social license is the province of Quebec. Check the website of the province of Quebec on the Ministry of Natural Resources. And in the end, after years of consultation and green papers and white papers and this and that, they've defined uh, adequate, uh, the achievement of social license as due process where citizens were engaged meaningfully in all phases of project inception, development, execution, and abandonment. And that, the current legislation of the NEB and SIA allows for it. We have the tools today we have the tools today to do that, uh, to achieve, earn a social license by way of a notional piece of paper or a concept, uh, I don't think is a practical uh, goal that anybody can have, unless your goal is to demonstrate that someone does not have the social license, that's much easier. But who could prove that they have social license? I think companies are a good corporate social responsibility program in communities where their employees work with others and the kids play hockey together. I think a company can have like a mine or maybe a Trans Canada or an Enbridge in the community where there is a hockey rink and people living together. I think you can achieve social license in a, in a, on a piece of land, but not on a 1,000 kilometers long pipeline. It's impossible. <laughs>